So this morning we have Nick Jorgensen to start off with uh, from Ideal, South Dakota. I mean, who would like to live in a town called Ideal? I mean, the ideal scenario, the ideal place. Uh, I can't wait to go up there. I was supposed to have been uh, with them earlier this year at their state meeting, uh, the Soil Coalition there in South Dakota, but due to circumstances, we had to be virtual. And that's where I heard Nick give this great presentation about virtual fence. And, uh, you know, a lot of the obstacles in the grazing world is I can't do it. I don't have time. How do I do all the wire? How do I do all this? Well, Nick is going to answer a lot of them questions this morning. Uh, Nick is the CEO of Georgeson Land and Cattle, uh, a magnificent ranch and farming operation where they uh, uh, specialize in Angus cattle and, and bull breeding and sell bulls all over the country and lease them. It's just a great opportunity. And I'm gonna let Nick tell a little bit about that. With about, well, I guess I'll just quit talking, Nick. Without any further ado, everyone give a round of applause to Nick Jorgensen. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, really, and like Jimmy said, I, I gave this talk here a, a while back for the for the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition's uh, annual Soil Health School. Um, you know, pretty unique situation to be in. Uh, at least for myself, where, you know, we, as I talk about this new product that we used last year and that we're going to use in 2021, somehow or another, I wound up being the person that, that gets to, to represent it, um, you know, to a large group of people. And I'm happy to do that. We've got some really cool results that we had with our virtual fencing uh, technology in 2020. And uh, it's, it's really just an honor to be able to talk about it. Uh, so, yeah, you know, thanks for the introduction again, Jimmy. He's Nick Jorgensen, Jorgensen yeah. line of cattle. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get this uh, presentation up on the screen here. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, versatile fencing technology and how we use it at Jorgensen line and cattle. Um, how this presentation is going to go is I'm going to take the first few minutes, uh, talk a little bit more uh, about myself, about Jorgensen line and cattle, just to give everyone that's watching a little background information about our operation. Uh, then I'll go into kind of how we do rotational grazing or did rotational grazing um, before virtual fencing technology on our operation. Uh, so I can kind of you know outline why we wanted to keep doing it, what the downsides were that we thought we could uh, improve upon with the implementation of virtual technology. And then I'm gonna talk about technology itself. So it should be a full 45 minutes here. Um, Jorgensen Land and Cattle, the Jorgensen family um, has been farming and ranching in Northern Trib County, South Dakota since 1909. Uh, the image you're looking at today is uh, not the original homestead, but the, but the yard where our facility is based out of right now. Um, that white building there is the old homestead house and it functioned as our office uh, until 2016. Uh, then we moved to our new facility as our business grew. Uh, we farm about 13,000 acres here in Northern Trib County. Uh, very diverse crop rotation. The, 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 the numbers there aren't necessarily representative of what we do every year, um, but this is just meant to portray that, you know, we're not in a, in a corn bean scenario out here. Uh, you know, we're South Central, South Dakota, west of the Missouri River. Um, and, you know, we've been no-till since 1991, uh, which, and honestly was the, was the year I was born, which basically means I've never known anything but a no-till scenario and not only that but a no-till and diverse crop rotation scenario. Uh, a lot of our rotation it's generally focused around winter wheat everything kind of keys off of the winter wheat acres in a given year. Uh, we generally follow winter wheat with a cover crop uh, and then cover crop with a corn um, sometimes a, a milo things like that and then everything else kind of falls in the mix after that. Couple new things we've been trying here the last few years are uh, 600 acres of full season cover. Uh, we've done that. This will be the third, 2021 will be the third year where we tried something like that, uh, where we're grazing cattle uh, on an acre of crop ground that was dedicated just for that purpose. We're not harvesting anything other than with you know, four hooves and a rumen. Uh, we also have 8,800 acres of native prairie pasture. So this is all in Northern Trip County. Uh, it's, it's beautiful cow country out here, um, and this is where we're blessed to run all of our cows. Um, it, 
we're also blessed that most of this is, is pretty tight. As far as location from our headquarters, we don't got to travel any more than probably 25 miles um, down the road. Now, as a crow flies, it's probably more like 10. Um, but, but to get there back and forth, it's 25 miles. And that makes a, a big difference for us. Uh, you know, when we start talking about how we implemented rotational grazing uh, as well as what some drawbacks are due to, you know, that distance, even though it's not as significant as it could be. So on those 8,800 acres of pasture, we manage about 850 head of Angus cows. And then in additional, depending on the year, um, it'll be somewhere around 150 head of, of recip cows. So all told in a normal um, summer scenario, we're going to manage about 1,000 cows out here um, uh, on this ranch here in Ideal. And most of these cows function as what we would call the nucleus herd um, for our Angus breeding program. Uh, which I'll go into right here. Um, so we got a 4,000 head feedlot, uh, excuse me. You can see the picture there on the right, kind of an aerial photo of the facility. It's a full quarter. Um, we got CAFO space for, for 4,000 head. Now what's unique about the operation is this feedlot that you're seeing here is when it's full, it is full of bulls. We're the largest seed stock producer in the United States uh, in 2020. Uh, the final numbers came in about 4,150 Angus bulls marketed. Uh, across the United States, the majority of that's done through a through a through a lease, a 90-day lease where we get cattle to a ranch. The rancher uses them um, for usually 60 to 90 days, then we bring them back and we care for them the rest of the year. And then we also sell quite a few bulls down in the South, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, along the Gulf Coast, a lot of bulls in Florida. And that whole program is built on a pretty storied. Uh, herd in the Angus breed. Uh, my grandfather Martin started breeding Angus cattle really in the in the late 50s is when he started and he made a pretty big name for himself in the late 60s uh, and into the 70s. Bred a couple bulls that uh, if you go ahead and, and trace back pedigrees through the American Angus Association, 93 to 94% of all Angus cattle registered through that breed association will will trace back to this ranch somewhere in their pedigree. Um, if you've ever heard of the Traveler line, um, the famous Traveler bull, his sire was born here. And then the Rito line, uh, we bred a pretty famous Rito bred bull here. And so it's, it's that story genetic history with the 850 cows we manage that then feed multiplier herds for us where we then buy bulls back uh, to use in our lease program. That kind of justifies the whole thing. It's, it's a strict breeding program and has a very good reputation. And that's how we're able to send so many cattle out uh, efficiently. I don't have the slide here, but I, I manage this operation with my dad, Brian, uh, my cousin, Cody, and my uncle, Greg. Uh, we've got about 17 full-time employees. And then depending on the time of the year, we'll have another five to seven um, part-time on staff, generally through the summer um, here in Ideal. I, I live, actually, you can, if you look, squint real hard, you can see my house in the background of that photo live here in Northern Trip County with my wife, Ashley. We've been married for um, not quite 10 years, eight years, and we've got four sons, four young sons. The two of the youngest are, are twins. So um, I guess I've done my job for, for carrying on the Jorgensen name. Uh, we've got a really busy household. So today, so the intent of this is to talk about virtual fencing technology and, and how we used it at Jorgensen Landing Cattle in 2020. So the first step is to probably explain how we use rotational grazing at Jorgen Salina cattle. So all the cows are managed in, you know, what I would call a, a rotational grazing system. Um, what we do is we break those cows up into five or six groups of roughly 200 head. Um, a couple groups are smaller, a couple groups are larger, but the average would be about 200 head. And most of them have access to five or 10 paddocks. Uh, I think the smallest number we've got is five and the largest um, is 13. We got one group that actually, if you look at this photo here, it's it's all these, um, this pasture here, all the fence lines you can see are access for one and a half or so groups of cows. Um, they're generally about 160 acres that we've been able to over time split with permanent fencing. We're really blessed to have some, some fencing done already that really enabled us to, you know, put rotational grazing in and, and do it without a lot of extra work. Uh, this this pasture you're looking at here is about 1200 acres uh, 1800 acres it's three sections of ground and you can see that it was split 
uh, back in the 80s into what is more or less quarters. Uh, we do have a couple large pastures, a couple half sections, uh, a couple sections, but on average, it's about 160 acres. And what we do in the summer is these, these the cattle are moved twice weekly from turnout date, which is generally around the middle of May. And we're moving them twice a week until sometime in mid-July to August. At that point, we transition to movement every, every 10 days. So that's kind of how it works for us. Um, what have we seen, you know, from positive results of rotational grazing? Now, I know I'm on a, on a Zoom call with a bunch of people who are, are experts in this. And I'm not going to sit here and claim to be an expert. What I'm going to do today is talk about the things we've seen and the things we've implemented at Jorgensen Landing Cattle. And, you know, try not to make a judgment as to what's superior or not, because to be honest, I'd make myself look like a fool in front of all you people who, who do this for a living. But nonetheless, we have seen some really true positive things from rotational grazing. Uh, we've noticed a lot more grazing efficiency and grass production in our pastures. Uh, that's, that's been a, that was in something we immediately noticed. Uh, and in addition to that, we have seen uh, natives really start to come back in some of these pastures that maybe in years past we had put a little bit too much pressure on. So we've been doing this uh, full scale since 2017. So we're going into our fifth rotational grazing year, not all that long, really. Uh, before that, the cows were managed in smaller groups. So we had more of them. We were managing more like 12 groups of cows. Uh, and basically what that did to us was just reduce the, the number of pastures we could rotate cows through. So, you know, we might only have a rotational system of, of, say, four paddocks for a group of cows, and they were getting more pressure, more frequent grazing, and we were suppressing the natives. And we've already seen, you know, the incidence of, of like, of brome grass and stuff like that start to decrease, and our, our western wheat grasses and our big blue stems, um, we have seen a resurgence in those species out on this native prairie. Another interesting thing we've noticed is the incidence of worms and fecal parasites um, in our cattle, in our cows specifically, has reduced significantly. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we do fecal tests every year just to make sure that you know, we're handling these things the way we should. And we've sent samples in where the lab that studied them couldn't believe that we weren't worming these cattle. We don't worm them. They don't get wormed in the summer um, because the incidence of worms in, that, you know, in the feces was so low that it would indicate in a normal scenario they had been wormed. But I think what we found is when you're moving these cattle frequently, um, you know, and they're, they're defecating those worms out, their life cycle is not all that long once they're out of the body. And when, we, when we're resting this pasture, it gives ample time for that life cycle to complete and die before they come back. So they're not eating live worms when they come back the next time, you know, where, where they may have gotten on blades of grass and things like that been a, a nice positive you know it saves us a little money on worming and you know the calves are better for it cows are better for it then we're better better able to track inventory um, in our herd because we're with them more you know we're with these cattle for most of the summer twice a week you know even if we're not moving them sometimes we're there three to four times a week you know to make sure they've got mineral make sure they've got water things like that so we have a better handle on you know, where all the cows are, not that we had a huge problem before, but we've got a better handle on where all the cows are, what the herd health is like. And another ancillary benefit is disposition has gotten a lot better because cows are, they're used to seeing us. Now, once again, we did not have a disposition problem before, um, but we've noticed a noticeable change in, you know, how, how accepting they are of people coming and showing up. Frankly, they're generally pretty excited because when they see people, it means they're going to fresh green grass, right? Um, and you kind of have to fight them off when you're going through gates and stuff because they're just, they're ready to be moved. So a lot of positive things. Um, the negative side effects of rotational grazing. And, and Jimmy mentioned a few of these things. I'm sure it's things you have all heard before. It's an immense amount of work. You know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be doing rotational grazing the way we are, right? Uh, you know, I've, I've been to, uh, South Dakota puts on a grazing school. I've been there once. We've had some employees that have been twice. And they always tell you, you know, move when the grass tells you to move, right? Look at the condition of your grass, be out there and, and you study it, which I, I agree theoretically is the, is the correct thing to do. But here's the problem we run into. We're not managing 10 or 20 or 50 or even 100 cows. We're managing 1,000. 
we're managing them in five groups spread out across 25 miles. And we're trying to move them as often as possible. And it just, it turns out that for this to work right, we, we've got to do it on a calendar. And so by nature, this restricts us. We're not able to push the grass as hard as we could, which we've seen grass production increase, but we, I, I'm confident we can see even more efficiency out of our pastures if we were able to be out there and you know, move these cattle and, you know, as the grass dictated. So we're out there scheduling these moves so we know that every, all the moves can happen with our crew of people. Uh, so we're not out there making a move on a Saturday or Sunday. We try not to do that to our employees. And we know that we can squeeze this stuff in. So how it works generally is we're moving them. You'll see here, like uh, on the far right column, we're moving them on a Monday and a Thursday or Tuesday and a Friday, uh, just so we can, we can physically get it done. Uh, there's, there's a lot of fence to be built ahead of these cattle in some places. Cause while we have good fence in most, sometimes it requires polywire. We don't do any pasture splitting at all because you know, in like these quarters that we've got built with permanent fence, we don't split them just because of the work it would take, you know, running a poly wire and then being out there and managing that is just not something that we're comfortable having to handle. So we've just allowed ourselves to be satisfied with where we're at. It was an improvement to the historical practices we had. And so that was how we leave it. Well, here's, those are the missed opportunities. The paddocks don't get utilized like they should. We over, we over utilize the grass, we under utilize the grass, we don't cross fence and we go off dates rather than grass condition. These are all things that uh, rotational grazing periods would tell you are, are not ideal. And I would be inclined to agree. We also like to rotationally graze farmland. I mentioned that full season cover. Well, we tried to rotationally graze that. Works fine if you wanna handle polywire. Here is a, is a picture of a quarter that we split four ways into 440s. It worked, but we were out there managing polywire, cutting strips, you know, moving fence. Uh, and we were still constrained, constrained by dates because this had turned into the sixth or seventh group of cattle that we were trying to move. Um, and we don't have the option, even if we wanted to permanently split this quarter of ground, it's not going to happen. Uh, we farm a lot of property and for that to work, we need to farm in big efficient tracks, which are quarters. And if I go to my father, Brian, who is the chief agronomy operations officer here and say, hey, dad, I, I want to split this quarter into four triangles, uh, he'd look at me like I was crazy and he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow it. And I don't blame him. And so we've got to be with polywire, at least under current, you know, under current fencing systems. So let's talk about Vince now. So Vince is a, is a company that developed a GPS collar uh, that you can put on cows or bulls or, or you know, whatever you wish um, to, to manage them with, without a fence. So we've been working with Vince since January of 2020. There's a long story about how we got and found them. I'm not going to go into it, but here's their information if you've never heard of them before. Uh, Vince.io is their website. Uh, so it started in January 2020. We work with their team to get about 275 collars that we were going to put on our bread heifers in the summer of 2020. And that was what we ended up doing. Uh, the vent system has three components. They got the collar, uh, which I've actually, I got some here. I, I don't know if it's maybe during the question and answer portion sometime later, I can show them. Uh, so they got the collar on the animal. There's a radio base station within a specific range of that collar that communicates with the collar, generally about four to five kilometers um, that, that the collar talks to. And then the base station is what is connected to a cellular network that send things to the cloud where we then manage the collars through the online platform. So that's where I go in and I, you know, or whoever can draw the fences, draw the fences the way we want them, see how the collars are doing, um, get historic grazing results, stuff like that. So those are the, the three components. Here's a, an image of their version one collar. So this is the collar that we used in 2020. All the communication equipment is contained inside of that, that gray little manifold there, if you will, or that, that housing. Uh, it has an internal battery with a life that's supposed to be about six months. So these don't have a solar panel. They're not rechargeable. Um, there are competitors to this product out there that, that have solar panels on them. Um, these don't. This is just a, a long life battery. And then it's held on by, by just by nylon straps. And on the bottom, there's a dive weight so that we can ensure that the collar stays placed over the neck in the orientation that they want. And that's how it works. It buckles onto the animal um, and 
it's not adjustable. So you make, you make the size for the neck and then that's kind of how it stays. This is what we used 275 of um, during the, the 2020 grazing season. Here's kind of how they fit. This is actually on a couple bulls uh, from this fall. So I, I did, did a poor job of um, photographically documenting how things went for us over this last year, but you can see, you know, fits over right behind the ear that you can kind of see the dive weight below that bull's nose. And it's intended to keep that collar the way it is on him or her. Base stations, here's kind of what they look like. Uh, you can see the solar panel there. So that's, that's how they generally work is they've got a solar panel that runs some batteries. Uh, all the communications equipment is inside that, that little uh, hutch there. And then there's a couple antennas up on a mast. The top one is the radio antenna that sends the signal out to the callers. And this bottom one is just an antenna that grabs cell signal. So um, these parts of, of the Vents product are the most expensive. Uh, it makes up a large majority of the cost actually. Um, with the solar panel, they're between ten and twelve thousand dollars a piece. Uh, and if we were to cover our whole operation, all twenty-two thousand acres we manage, it would take seven or eight of them, maybe nine. Uh, but you can really reduce the cost if you can get them close to a power line, because the solar panel itself costs nine grand. Uh, without the solar panel, this thing is three thousand dollars, very affordable. Um, and you know, it's it's the nature of of it. I mean, you're going to need solar in some places where you can't get the power. Um, they'll cover a large area. And then, like I said, everything that's sensitive inside is stored in the, in the cabinet. Currently today, we have three solar powered base stations and one AC powered station. Uh, for 2021, with the plans we've got, we're going to need another solar powered base station. And like I said, to get to capacity, we need an additional two to three after that, just to cover all of our, of our property. Then here's just a quick screenshot of the online platform. It's very easy to use. You can add landmarks. Uh, you can draw paddocks where the pastures are. Uh, you put schedules into the collar, and that's how it knows what to do and when to do it. Um, you know, you use a, a GPS map to draw your your fences, what they call them. You know, the the fence that actually keeps them in. Uh, and then this is also where you access historical grazing results uh, and stuff like that. So I'm going to get into how it actually worked for us. Uh, I talk about the product all day, but what's important here is you know, did it work or did it not? So we rotationally grazed our heifers with this collar in 2020. And you look at the image here, the blue box is what I would, is, is just a grass pasture. And then the green box is, was a 117, or excuse me, a 90 acre field of forage wheat, which is where we actually rotationally grazed the heifers. Um, so how it worked was we placed them on several days beforehand. Uh, actually, when we AI'd them is when we did it because they were in the chute. Uh, had the collars on, they weren't doing anything for the first week. As a matter of fact, they were north. If you want to just kind of see that that little that little crick here in the center of the image, they were up here for several days with the collar just telling us where they were, and it worked kind of nice because we, one day we had them get out, and uh, the only reason we knew was because the collars told us. You know, they didn't notify us, but we got on the platform and saw that the heifers were out. Um, so the, that was the first phase was just inactive tracking mode. The second phase was training, which took place in the blue square and then the third phase was actual rotational grazing after they had been trained on the collar uh, which took place in the green square so the tracking mode uh, like i said if, if if you can envision this pasture here this blue area and this blue area the heifers had them on they weren't doing anything no vences uh, let us make sure that we were comfortable that the collar could do its job of telling us where the heifer was um, you know, we can see how they handled keeping them on, things like that. And, and like I said, this, this was a heat map of the entire time they were in this area. And right over here was on the specific day we went to move them, we couldn't find 30 or 40 of them. Well, here's where they were, right in this, where all these little white dots are. They had gotten over a rise. They were kind of down in a bottom and we couldn't see them other than we would have found them eventually. But, you know, we used the, the collars to locate them a little quick, more quickly. So training the animals. After we had done a few days of tracking, we moved them into their training paddock. This was 117 acres of grass with a solid perimeter fence around basically the entire thing. So they had real fence everywhere. And this is important because the idea is to teach them to retreat back from the collar when they get stimulus. The first thing they'll get is a sound. Uh, and after they walk through the sound zone, if you will, they, they get a shock 
right? And so what we want to do to train them is, is place that vents directly over the real fence. So you can see here what we did um, is we placed those vents, those red lines right over where the real fence was. And the idea is as they walk up to the real fence and see it, they're going to start getting that beep. And then if they get too close to the real fence, they're going to get a shock, right? And to make sure that they behave correctly, you need that fence there because when they get shocked, they're going to want to run. Well, the only way they can run is, is backwards, right? It's not going to train them to run forwards and run through it, which is what we don't want. It's going to force them to turn around. Um, and it works really well when you do it right. Over the three days of training, 90% of the heifers received a sound, but only 10% received a shock. So that indicates to me that they don't all have to be, they don't all have to get that electric stimulus. They'll, they'll learn from the herd for the ones that actually tested it, turned around and ran the other way that, hey, this sound means something bad's about to happen. I need to turn around and go the opposite direction. You'll also see that if you look really close here, you'll see that between these two red lines, there's a big concentration of cattle. And what that basically means is they were hearing that sound and they were stopping, right? They, the, it was stopping them. You don't see a whole lot of intrusion into this red zone, which is the sock zone. You see a little bit here and a little bit over here. Um, but for the most part, this outer fence, I mean, it stopped them. So uh, worked really well. The, the intrusion we did get generally occurred because, and I'll talk about this in the downsides of the collar, these things like to flip over. The way they were designed in V1, they would flip over. So the prods that were intended to deliver the electric stimulus were just in the air, not doing anything. So while some of these heifers were getting was sound and eventually they learned, well, whatever. Um, it's just sound, it's not doing any problem. So I'm gonna walk wherever I want. Um, but for the ones that had it on correctly, uh, it worked extremely well. They didn't get, they, they didn't have to take a shock very often to figure out um, where the fences were. So training went well. So after we trained them, we moved to the forage wheat field. So what we did with this forage wheat field was we broke it into three fifties. And I know that doesn't add up to, you know, 70 acres, but there was some overlap there. Three fifty acre paddocks, more or less. Um, the red lines so the three images here, you can see the three paddocks we used. We started on the north, which is this uh, picture here. We went to the middle and then we went to the south. Um, there, there's real fence on the south side, the east side, and there wasn't any on the north side actually. So we had a, a bit of poly wire there. I don't even think it was hot just so they could see something. Uh, the point is uh, there was a lot of vents. This was all vents. The middle paddock was almost entirely um, GPS fence. And all three paddocks con con converged on the watering facility, which was this old feedlot over here. We had a pen that had a mirror font water in it. And that was where we watered these cattle, which in hindsight was, was perfect. It's exactly what we wanted in this scenario to try and rotate these cattle without any human intervention. The water was key because it functioned as a gathering point. So when we wanted to move them from paddock one to paddock two, uh, they'd go to the water, they'd go outside of paddock one, paddock two would turn on and now they can't get back to where they originally were and they've effectively been moved, right? So the, the fence, the, the technology itself functions like a check valve. If they, if they walk towards the fence, they're gonna get sound and then eventually they're gonna get shock. If they decide, to, to take that shock, it goes for 90 seconds and it'll shock them 45 times. Um, at that point in time, it stops, it completely stops. It's, it's a fail safe built in, which I totally agree with that after that it disables the collar. But, so if, if this heifer is supposed to be in this paddock and she walks through and winds up, you know, in this green area, if she decides to go back through, it's not gonna deliver any stimulus whatsoever. She can travel right back through, no problem at all. And then as soon as she tries to turn around and go back out, she's, she's trapped again. So that's how we used it to move them is they'd be in this paddock. They'd come to water. This paddock shut off. This one turned on and now they can't go back this way. And so we were effectively able to rotate these cattle and here's the results. So here's some heat maps uh, that showed, you know, the effectiveness of the collars during this rotational grazing experiment. On the whole, we contained 86% of the heifers over the rotational grazing window. Uh, we didn't have to physically move any cattle paddock to paddock. There was one instance where we had a thunderstorm and um, kind of all rules went out the window. They, they disobeyed the collars, which once again, I cannot blame them for. 
We did have to go get them back in, um, but we did not have to move them. The system moved them all themselves. And like I said, 86% of the heifers, now it's important to note here, 86% of the heifers is not 86% of 275. A lot of these colors fell off on us. We were the first install at Vince where we did it ourselves. Generally, the company was there to do it. We did it ourselves. And to be honest with you, we did it flat wrong. We put them on the animals too big and they were pushing them over their heads and the collar was laying on the ground. Uh, and then, like I said, some of them tended to flip if you put them on too large. And so by the time it was all done, we had about half that actually had a working collar. We were able to contain 86% of that half, which in my opinion is more impressive because these are herd animals, right? And so when there's half of the animals just kind of out there doing whatever they want, it would have to be a really hard thing for those other half to look at them and not see a fence and not want to be hurting with them, right? So the fact that we were able to overcome that herd pressure and still get the electric and sound stimulus to tell them where they could and couldn't go, in my opinion, was, was really impressive. And you can see here too that, I mean, they were the ones that had the collar on knew the boundary. They, they knew right where they could go. They knew right where they couldn't. Um, and, it, and it worked pretty darn well. The downsides. This was the first time that they had, the collars had been used in a rotational grazing scenario which was good. We were happy to try it out. We really wanted to see how it would work. Number one problem was we drained the batteries like crazy. This was a programming problem inside the collar, which thank goodness we did this experiment because they didn't know that they had the problem and they were able to fix it. But basically what happened in a nutshell was these collars were constantly in shock mode. If, if they're standing out in the middle of a the field, they're kind of in just like sleep mode where it talks to the tower about once a minute. Uh, but once it recognizes that it's getting close to a, to a shock zone, it starts talking once a second. Well, these paddocks were small enough and we had enough fences going on here that they were constantly talking and it just, it drained the batteries. As a matter of fact, I mean, we killed some of them in, you know, three weeks that should have lasted six months. Wasn't a battery problem. It was literally just a programming problem and they were able to fix it. So uh, great news there. Uh, like I said, install issues. We only had half of the callers actually functioning. Um, and a lot of that comes down to just to be 100% candid, this prototype collar we got was extremely difficult to put on. Um, how it works is, I mean, if you're going to do it right, you're going to get a heifer in the chute. You're going to measure her neck and find out that it's 34 inches Then you're going to build a 34 inch collar. When you build these collars, they're the size that you make them and they can't be any other size. It's not like a belt where I can adjust it. I built the 34 inch collar. And if I want to make it a 35, it's going to take me 15 minutes to do it. Huge problem, uh, in my opinion, and they're working to fix that in their version two collar. But basically what happened was we, we estimated, right, the distribution of neck sizes. And on the last 70 head, um, they were either way too big or way too small. We didn't have the right fitting ones. Uh, led to the collar falling off and flipping. Um, major product change coming that should help that quite a bit. Then this fall, uh, we put them on bulls. We put 200 call callers on bulls after we finished the heifer experiment. Uh, we did that for about three weeks. Uh, and then when we preg checked them in July, we took the callers off because most of them were dead. Uh, and then we got a refresh group, put them on bulls, gave them access to 720 acres of stubble. We started this in, I think, September, or October, maybe November. It was later. Um, we didn't rotationally graze them. This was just a please stay here kind of deal. We had real fence everywhere, but this little triangle, or this little rectangle coming out and this south side, everything else was real. So there was about 1.7 miles of virtual fence. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, this experiment was a tough one. And, and here's why. Our feedlot is right here. These bulls had just come out of the feedlot. Uh, they could see the feedlot. Um, and when they saw those feed wagons going in that hay, um, we, we, we determined that they will grit their teeth and they will take 90 seconds of pain just to try and get to, to feed. They had plenty, but um, we're pretty familiar with bulls. They're kind of a pain and that's what they did. So uh, we, we had a hard time with, with the bulls. Uh, nonetheless, it was a good experiment to try. Cost benefit. These collars are rented. We don't own them. We rent them for $38 a year. Uh, we own the base station. So that's about another $50 a year. Um, or it adds up to a total of 50 when we can get a thousand. This would be if we could get to full scale, a thousand collars on all of our animals to 
to distribute the cost of the base stations out across that many head plus the variable cost of the collar. It's about $50 a year. And this is not cost per head. This is cost per collar, right? So that's for 12 months of collar use, 50 bucks. Well, we have the ability to get two use periods out of it. Cows in the summer, bulls in the fall, assuming we get all these issues sorted out uh, from a fitment perspective. For our operation, if we were able to roll this out at full scale, that is a cost reduction for us um, from a fencing perspective. I mean, you guys know what it would cost to build a mile of fence. I think it's $11,000 to build a mile of fence. So if we got a, a section of farm ground that we want to split into four quarters, that's two miles of fence, right? That's 22 grand. It doesn't take many sections of farm ground like that to add up to more than, you know, $50,000 a year, right? Um, and then that, that and the added benefit of not having maintenance to do on your fences because uh, you can keep them off them in most cases. Um, this to us is a cost savings in the long run, really is at $50 a collar. So future improvements, um, they got a, ver Vince has a version two collar. Um, I, once again, I have it here. Uh, it's, it's a drastic improvement to their original collar. What we learned in 2020 was the technology works, right? The concept works, the online platform works. Using it to do what we wanna do works. The hardest part, is keeping the collar on the animal. That's the part that Vince is working through uh, here in the, in the short term to really scale this business up is, hey, the, the technology is great, but it doesn't do us a darn thing if it's, if it's laying in a pasture, right? So let's get fitment right. Um, and they're ramping up their production system. They only had 5,000 cattle collared in 2020. Um, they're working on a production system now where they could get to 50 to 75 to 100,000 collars a year out. So that's kind of where they're at. And here's the possibilities and kind of 2021 outlook for our operation. Gives us access to new property. Vince will tell you that, you know, they can, that this would eliminate fence someday in the long run. And I'm not going to rule that out, but I can tell you in the short term, the way I see this working is a good exterior fence, right? Let's just say you got a section of ground with a fence around it. Perfect. Let's use that as a fail safe. So if the 10% that get out don't end up on a road, that's great. And then we'll use the collars to rotationally grade, graze inside of that section or that half section or, or what have you. So for us, that opens up a lot of new property. Uh, here's an example right here. This is, a, if you can see this image, the green line is some property we own by our hunting lodge, the Lazy J Grand Lodge. Uh, it's basically two sections of ground. It's, two, it's one and a half sections of ground. And we don't graze any of it. There's 1,100 acres of pasture in there that we don't graze because of all the white lines. The white lines are hunting strips. We can't have cattle grazing in our hunting strips. And we're not gonna go out there and string wire up on all those. Well, let's talk about using the collar, right? We've got a real fence to make sure they're not out on a main road. Let's use the collar to keep them out of those, of those hunting strips. And guess what? If I'm only containing 85% or 90% of them, the 10% that are out there roaming around through the strips aren't going to do any measurable damage. And we've achieved our goal, right? So it gives us access to new property. By my estimation, uh, if we were able to roll this out on all the cows and all the bulls, it would give us about an additional 6,000 acres that we can graze uh, on our operation without having to build dedicated fence to, to rotate it the way we want. Um, you can monitor time spent at waters and mineral feeders. That's a technology coming down the pipe inside of that collar. Um, heat detection is an option because I'm told that the first thing that is noticeable when a, when a um, heifer comes into heat or a cow is their movement pattern changes. Well, now we're watching their movement pattern. So uh, that's an exciting idea. And then really long-term far out would be, you know, can you imagine where you've got an NDVI map that's looking at your pasture and it's automatically communicating with the caller saying, okay, it looks like this grass has been grazed enough. Let's just move you a little bit over here, right? And we're going to just let technology tell us where the best place for these cattle to be is. And I don't even have to be involved or my team doesn't even have to be involved. These are all options, you know, with this technology. Uh, those are, they're obviously not real yet, um, but there's no reason that they couldn't be in the future. So with that, I'm right at my 45 minutes. Uh, I hope this was educational to everyone. I, I've been asked to hang around. I don't know exactly when question and answer it is. I don't think it's right now. So um, happy to do this, real honor. And I, I look forward to a chance to, to uh, you know, answer a few questions at some point. So Nick, there's going to, I think there's one in the chat. Uh, if you could look at the chat room and, and answer a few of them. And if there's other people, uh, if you want to go down to the, 
middle of the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says chat. I'm gonna you can stop go sharing. on there and you can there send you. Uh, Nick a, a yeah. question. Yeah, so, you want to, I really appreciate it, Nick. Absolutely. So do you want me to answer this, this one that I see here? Fencing yeah, you can answer one. this one and we'll move on right quick. Yeah. So one of the other use cases I did not go through in this presentation was we we had a small pasture, uh, 160 acres that has a really has a big dam in it, but it's a dam that we don't want cattle in because it's it's a really good habitat, a great fishing pond. Um, and so what I what we did was we fenced it out uh, in 2020. Uh, we had a water facility somewhere else, and that's exactly what we did is we used those GPS callers to keep them away from that pond and it worked just like it was supposed to. Here's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, the reason we don't like physical fence around dams is, you know, when it gets 110 degrees outside, I don't care how much, how good the fishing is. I want the cows in the dam. If they're gonna need to cool off or get to extra water, let's let them get into it. Well, with a collar, I don't have to go out there on Sunday and open a gate and hope that they're there. All I gotta do is get on my phone, disable the vents and those cows have access to that water. So it is more efficient in that regard. All right, well, thank, thanks a lot, Nick. And there may be some more uh, come into the chat room. If you want to just type your answer in, in there, that would be really cool. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and the effort uh, to be with us today to show the new possibilities. And I think this is the future of grazing. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, great pioneers like Jorgensen is uh, taking this on and uh, helping Vince, uh, you know, make their system better and so that we can right. all use it. We really appreciate it. Well, we're, we're happy to do it. I mean, we, we think it's the future too, or, or we wouldn't have gone through what we did, right? I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you and say it was an easy thing because there were some struggles along the way. And I'm okay with that because you're not going to learn if you're not going to have a little bit of trouble, right? And so I haven't lost faith in the idea. Right. I, I think it's, it's there. It's just going to take a little bit of time. All right. Well, we really appreciate it.